and we'll go ahead and get started. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for attending our second Laser Mastery uh, Mastermind session here, where we're going to be picking the brain of Dr. Tim Anderson. And before we get to uh, Dr. Anderson, I just wanted to lay it down a little bit of the framework for the call today. We're going to be, everybody will be muted. And if you have any questions as we go in the chat box, um, go ahead and put your question in there. And then Kevin Henry Fortune Management has helped moderating. I'm going to save the last 15 minutes for interactive questions and he'll repeat those. So if anything comes up or there's anything that you want us to touch upon um, today, just put it in that chat box and then we'll do that at the end in the 15 minutes. And also today, I believe obviously clinical expertise with the laser is crucial in the foundation for success. But tonight's call is really about the business side of lasers and how we can grow our business. And that's why I have Dr. Anderson here because he has done a tremendous job. I've been to hundreds of offices all around the country and um, what he's done there is amazing. So um, my goal for you all today is to be able to take home some pearls of what others have done to succeed at a very high level and hopefully take that back and help you. Or if you're investigating lasers, you can see what lasers can do for you in a practice. So that's the goal for today. So with that being said, I want to introduce Dr. Anderson. You guys have probably read his bio, so I'll let you read about where he went to school and everything else. But Tim is located in Bismarck, North Dakota. And what he has done there, starting from nothing, starting a practice on his own to where he's at today in the short amount of time, it's really unbelievable, and I, and I really want to lead with that, um, Tim. I know that you've done a lot with technology, with Sarek Docs, Celea Doctors, your, your KOL and 3D printing, but tonight, let's practice. I want to talk about your growth and what you've done, so I'm going to turn it to you for just one second, Tim, and, and tell, the, tell everybody here from when you got to Bismarck and started, when it was, and kind of just your, your progression so people can get a sense of what you've done. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the intro, Nick, because normally when we come on these calls, one of the last things most of us get really excited about is listening to a bio of whoever's doing it. <laughs> but in this context of business and growth and, and how it impacts your own practice, I think having a mindset of, of how and where I came from is important because it gives validity to some of the concepts that you know we'll be talking about tonight. And, and like Nick said, I... You know, when I got out of school, it, I did like most people, I just went to find a job. I mean, the job market was difficult back then, which is totally ironic nowadays, because nowadays we've got too many jobs and we can't find anybody to work. But when I started, there was, I didn't have anything. And so I did like many, and I went down the DSO route. And that was a very important aspect of my practice because, or my journey, because it taught me kind of the foundations of the business side of how I could run my team, how I would look at my systems. And so I came away actually with a great experience, but what I also learned that it was not for me because I didn't have the control to let the practice match my own personal vision. And that was a core concept that was missing. And so we made the crazy decision to roll the dice and do a startup practice. And there's a reason most people don't do a startup practice. And I always tell my wife, ignorance was bliss because, you know, it was one of those things sometimes we didn't know enough and it, it worked out. But ultimately, we had the core principles and the foundation of our vision and our mission within our practice. And we went and we started really, really small. I mean, really small. It was me and an assistant, and that's it. And so it, literally was me doing all my own hygiene, all my own everything. But what that did is it did a couple of things. One, it taught me good way to hate dentistry, do your own hygiene. And I apologize if there's any hygienists on the call, but for me, that was just like, oh my gosh, like I need to be doing what I want to do. But what it allowed me to do was have a lot of face time with my patients. And that was something that was very impactful, not only to them, but to me, because it allowed me to start developing a culture and attract a certain type of patient that wanted this. And soon we just started to continue to roll. And, and as Nick said, technology has been a big aspect to that. And technology was really not meant to drive ROI, drive this. It was really meant to allow me to have more fun doing the dentistry I wanted to do. And the byproduct was 
all of a sudden we started expanding our scope of services. We expanded how we were providing those services and we really started to attract a patient base. And that little tiny little three operatory office in seven years now, we just moved into the facility I'm in right now, which is an 8,000 square foot, really state of the art building that matches my philosophy of who I am as a clinician. And what the unique aspect of that is my patients that have been with me from the beginning, even the ones that were in with that tiny little office, still to this day, this is still the same concept. Like it makes sense to them. And really when I integrate technology, it always fits that vision of providing the best clinical outcomes I can for my patients, having more fun doing what I'm doing, developing a better culture, improving my efficiencies and speed. And that whole process allows myself and my team to continue to grow. So it's been a crazy journey. And when I look back on that, there are certain aspects of that growth that were so impactful. And like I, I always continue to talk about, and you'll hear me say it a lot tonight, that patient culture. And one of the things that we do in dentistry is we got to remember that our patients are consumers. And as a consumer, patients purchase and provide and want things that they value. And for me, I started looking at how we look at dentistry and what patients value and what they don't. And luckily for us, you know, the bar is set pretty low in most parts of the country. Like it doesn't hurt, you know, they were nice to me, that, that's kind of the bar. So it's really easy for us to exceed patients' expectations. And what I found for me was that digital technology allowed me to then go into a realm of providing a service that far exceeded their expectation. And laser dentistry was the one aspect that truly allowed me to provide a service in a manner that none of my competition could do and that, to be honest, was a total mindset shift for my patients of what it means to come to the dentist and how dentistry is delivered. And that is honestly what got the cog going in this practice growth. And then all of a sudden it's expanded to today, where now like we're known as the technology office, but more importantly, we're known as the laser office. And that's always something that's really near and dear to me. Uh, ironically, Nick, you know, has been one of my mentors from that from the beginning as he was one of my main trainers early on in my journey. And so it's, it's been a whirlwind, which is why I'm here tonight. And I, I hope as Nick and I kind of can go down this road, you guys can see that I am as passionate about this and I want to be here to share my story because I know what this technology can do for every style of practice whether you're new to lasers, whether you are potentially interested in lasers, or you've been doing lasers for the last 20 years. I think there's something we can all take away here tonight. So that's, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point. And I just wanted to kind of expand on it. I was actually just writing an article about this because the most common question I get is which laser should I buy? And I always answer them and I say, what do you want to do and what's your passion? <laughs> what do you want to do better? And I said, ask yourself, what kind of experience do you want to provide the patients that walk in the door? If you just uh, spend some time thinking about that, it'll lead you to which laser you want because lasers can do different things. So that's the first step in determining what you wanna do in regards to the technology. So just to expand a little bit, Tim, on what you just said, but from going from a startup, a nouveau practice, you know, no patients, ground zero to now 8,000 square foot, um, you know, and, and having tremendous success. Tell, tell what were some of the keys that the laser was able to provide to you um, during that journey? What were some of the things that you did that you think the laser really helped to grow that practice during that time? Well, I, I honestly think it did two separate things. And, you know, I think the, the easiest one for most of us to wrap our head around, and, and when we talk lasers, I'm specifically talking about a 9.3 CO2. Because like you said, lasers is like, a lasers is an all encompassing term and, and you're talking about totally different technology. And so for me as a general dentist, when I looked at who my patients were, I looked at the by volume, what was the one of the number one coded restorative procedures I did in my office. And whether I like it or not, it was a class two composite. 
And so I wanted to look at laser technology or potentially technologies that could improve the patient experience for the class two composite because for me, it's all about touches. I wanna to be able to do this all day, every day and impact the greatest volume of patients. And so when I looked at integrating this from the patient standpoint, you gotta think of what it means to go to the dentist for a patient. Like patients are changing. Uh, they value different things. Their time is important. People don't wanna miss work. I always tell my team, like when a patient is in our chair, they are making a huge commitment because most of them have taken a half day or a full day PTO to be there. And that's important because what they're really saying is that I value this experience at your office enough that I'm going to use my limited PTO rather than spending it with my time with my family on a vacation, doing this or that. They're saying that this is important enough. And for me, that was really important for as a clinician that I needed to meet their expectation. And what laser technology allowed me to do was do procedures that I do all day, every day in a fashion that I never thought possible. Meaning I could do them faster and I could do them without anesthetic. And the lack of anesthetic for me was more of a gimmick in the early days. It was like, oh, it's, they're trying to sell me on this. What I didn't realize was how impactful the ability to even provide 50% anesthetic free to my patients, what impact that would have my patients. People that have jobs where that they, they, they can't take off work because they got a meeting or they don't wanna be numb or, or all that. And I started finding like my patients hate being numb. It wasn't the shot, like they hated being numb. And when you sit patients up and they have that wow moment of like, oh my gosh, like that was fast quick, easy, painless, like, I, like I've never had a feeling like that. And all of a sudden I created this opportunity where patients would advocate based on an experience for a filling. Like you don't see that anywhere on dentistry. And so it just allowed my practice to flourish because people were saying, hey, if you need a filling, you gotta go to this guy. And ironically, and I, I've joked with you about this in the past night that it backfired on me because all of a sudden I got all of a sudden I started attracting like every crazy kid and parent that didn't want anesthetic or a shot. And I started having to retailer that. So the patient experience really was one facet of that laser integration that truly was the foundation of my practice growth. I mean, it really started to turn the tide and separate me from the, the crowd. But to be honest, looking back now, years later, I look at what it did for me as a clinician and the clinical impact that had on my profession and my direction as a clinician. And it taught me to reevaluate how I looked at dentistry, how I looked at technology, how I looked at possibilities of what I could and could not do as a clinician. Um, when I look at my procedural depth and diversity, before in my startup. I mean, when I started a startup, I'm a general practicing clinician. I was doing drill and fill, dentures, a little endo here and there. The laser allowed me to reduce barriers for my patients to say no to the treatment that they needed. And it allowed the barriers for me as a clinician to go away. When I didn't, when I could do things so much easily, more easily because they I didn't have to rely on the scalpel or I didn't have to rely on crazy suture techniques. It, it allowed me to expand my surgical foundation and allowed me to be honestly, to do procedures that I could never do with a blade. I mean, I look at the way I did phrenectomies before and the way I do them now, I'm like, you wonder why I never did them before. Where now that just has grown into both soft tissue and hard tissue growth that seven years later, I can't imagine not doing those. I mean, let alone the growth of ROI. And that's why I always talk with people about, you know, we all focus on overhead and costs and expenses and, and production, but we all ultimately know that if you really do good quality, good dentistry and you take care of people and you have a good vision, the numbers and the proceed, like if you're doing those things, the, the growth and the financial rewards come with that. The, the, the financial incentive was never buy a laser because I want to make more money. 
or grow new patients. It was, a, it honestly was like, I wanted to integrate a laser so I could do half my fillings without an anesthetic because I wanted to attract more people to my office as a startup. Like that's all I wanted to do. And then all of a sudden it just grew into this like, holy crap, I can do, what can't I do with that? And to be honest, even this day, we're still developing and learning new things that we can do with this technology that floor me. So I think you've got the clinician side and the patient side that are equally important, but the, the patient side was easy for me to wrap my head around. The clinical side for my growth was something that I was not really prepared for. But when I look at my foundation of my practice, that component was the key to allowing us to grow at a rate and not necessarily the initial growth, but to maintain that growth. We didn't plateau because we were able to continue on. Kim, let me, uh, that's perfect because you, you talked about these two things, the patient experience and your clinical growth. I want to expand a, first on the patient experience, then the clinical. The patient experience, um, tell, you know, I think it's so important and I preach this. For me, I, the, I say, you know, restorative is not a fun thing for most dentists. Some people like to do it, but I tell you what, that's how the patients judge you is by that experience. And it is so critical. And if you just step outside the box and realize most people don't go to the dentist because of that, 65% of the people. And when I tell people on an airplane or on the streets what I do, they're like, you can do that? What? They have no clue that it's even possible. So tell me about, because I know you have a great team. I know that you measure patient experience. You survey patients. So for you guys out there, I want you to know that it's critical, one, that your team has comprehensive and coherent communications about what the technology can do for them. And you need to measure that. So can you talk to me a little bit about what you do in your practice so that your team is on the same page and that you know, what are you doing during your procedures to know what it is? Because it's one thing to say patient experience, but objectively, what is that? How do you measure that in your practice? I love that you said that. We were, I was just having a conversation with uh, another clinician recently at another uh, event I was at regarding like why patients come to us. And everybody's like, well, it's the patient experience. Like we treat our patients well. I'm like, we all treat our patients well. Like no dentist is like, I'm gonna be an ass. Like I'm gonna be mean to my people because I don't like it. Like people aren't like that. But what you really are hitting on is articulating what is it that makes me more unique than the guy down the street. Like, what is it? And I think ultimately what that comes down to is knowing and understanding your patients. When you look at other industries and professions, not necessarily professions, but other like industries, there's a very clear directive on how they measure their customers, what their interests are, they pull, they test, they do all this. In dentistry, we run blindly because we come from a generations of like, hey, my great grandma went there, I'm gonna go there, or I'm in your insurance network, so that's why I go there. The world is changing and people change how they spend their time and money very differently now than they did 30, 40 years ago. And one of the things that's critical to my growth is having us have a good understanding of our patients and why they come to us and how their experience was. And we as clinicians take for granted because we do it all day, every day, how big of an impact local anesthetic is on our patient base. And we take for granted because we do this all day, every day, how much stress and anxiety this has for some of our patients. And it's so important sometimes to take a step back and really start to understand the psychology. And when I talk to new students going to dentistry, I'm like, you're gonna, like everybody talks about the biology, the physics, the artistry of dentistry, but I would argue probably the two biggest aspects of dentistry as successful dental practices are having a core concept in business understanding and a very good and most importantly, good core understanding of psychology. Because if you understand the psychology of your patients, who your patients are, and you understand your business model and your business, you will be successful because the dentistry is easy. I'm sorry, it is. Like what we do is relatively learnable and easy, but learning to read people and connecting with humans can be more difficult. So I teach my team that they need to understand that every one of our patients are different and we need to understand why 
they may have not had a good experience. So any patient that comes to my office from another office, I, the first thing I ask is not where'd you come from? I wanna go, what made you decide to switch? Like not why you came to us, but what made you decide to go somewhere else? And then I expand on that. And then, then I wanna know also, why did you choose our office? What was it about our marketing, our philosophy, our vision, whatever what it was, why did you come? Because those are sometimes two different, very different answers that tell us a lot about the patient. But then it allows us to tailor their patient experience to the laser equally, because if somebody had a terrible experience with anesthetic, I couldn't get numb, I couldn't get this, or they had a lot of pain, or you know, they, they hated being numb because they bit their lip really bad, or you know, they just, whatever it might've been, it allows us to tailor that psychology. And my team is the most important aspect to the successful integration of my laser, hands down. It is the most critical aspect because my team sets me up for success. It's no different than a new patient. When you walk in at the door as a doctor to a new patient, your team has either won the patient or lost the patient. You're just the icing on the cake or the nail in the coffin. Like that's what it is. It's one of those two because the foundation has been laid by your team. And my team members are very good about really connecting with the patient of, okay, what is, what are your anxieties? What are your fears? And really explaining, okay, this is like, we treat us almost like kids, the show tell do, but we're setting an expectation. And in my office, it's really important to exceed expectations. So I'm not going to tell them, oh, you, it's painless and it's silent. No, I'm going to say like, hey, you're going to feel a ton of cold and it's going to come up and down. You might feel a thing here and there, but ultimately I also want to let the patient know that they're in control. If you, Mrs. Jones, need or want us to stop to get anesthetized, to get a shot, and I use the term shots intentionally, then we will. I give the patient the autonomy. And so we're setting the stage so that way they know what to expect. And I know it's going to be better than that for them, but we're setting the expectation like, okay, they're waiting, you know, they know it's coming. And when it comes, they, they know it. And then we can transition in, but it takes a team to understand it. Now that's the, that's the, the physics of like how to do it. What's more important is the celebrating of the concept of what it is like, no matter when we get done with the procedure, you know, if it's good or bad, we always celebrate. We always celebrate. Like, can you believe we just did this filling in half the amount of time and you didn't have to get numb. You can go right back to work. You can eat, you can talk. You can, isn't that amazing? And even if they had maybe like a lot of sensitivity or something like that, they're equally like, oh yeah, that was awesome. Like I never, like now that you put it that way, you're right. Like, this is amazing. I'm just done. And it allows us to go through and just continue on. But Nick, I love that you, you mentioned the fact that we survey our patients. And I do this to this day with every single laser patient. My laser patients, all patients are rated on a scale and there's icons in their chart for their scale because it allows my team members to schedule appropriately. Meaning after we have a laser experience, I walk out of the room and my assistants do an interview with the patient. Like, hey, Mrs. Jones, you know, we did this. This was a really deep filling. You know, it's amazing we did it with the laser. You know, a lot of people feel a little cold. Some people feel a lot. You know, what was your experience? And then they'll, they'll mention this or that. But even if they had a lot of sensitivity, one of the next follow-up questions is like, okay, Mrs. Jones, would you next time rather get a shot and be numb for the next four hours? Or would you rather have the laser? And that's an important question because it may surprise you as a clinician what your patients may feel and what they want. And once you get over that, it allows you to provide the service that is tailored to that true customized patient experience for them. Because I will do that even if they were sensitive, some patients are sensitive, but they're like, I don't care. Like, I want this. Where if I didn't ask them those questions, I might have written that off as like, oh, this wasn't successful. I need to move on. And I'm, now I'm not going to do it again. So you learn a lot from that, but it also allows me to like those people that are like, dude, I didn't feel a thing. That was awesome. They get this special slay all-star icon. And then all of a sudden I know every filling, everything we do, they're laser only. We're going to fly. We don't have to educate them. We don't have to talk about it. We just go because they are great. 
We also have patients that are laser, but maybe they're, they're up and down. They have some great experience, some not, but they want the laser. And then I have other patients that, you know what, you guys, it doesn't matter how good it is, they don't want to feel a thing in the world and they'd rather be numb. And that is okay. And I label it to them. So I tailor my practice to the patient perspective. They're paying for the therapy. They're paying for the restorative. They're paying for the treatment. How we get there, anesthetic or not, I don't care. I always use the laser. The, what the patient gets to decide is numb or not numb. That's it. But the laser, I'm going to use the laser. So that's kind of how my patient interaction with my team goes. Well, and I can't tell you how many times I, over the last 20 years being in dental offices, going in, doing hundreds of these trainings, I can usually tell within the first, first 15 minutes if this office is going to succeed clinically in a business size with the laser. And half of the equation is the doctor and the other half is the team attitude. And I can tell you what, for the doctors that are on here, I cannot tell you how important pre-framing the experience in your doctor is in the laser technology. And then like you said, Tim, asking questions, <laughs> okay? They don't care about where you want to go and what you do They and what you can do. They care about, and you should ask every patient this, what's most important to you in our dental business today for new patients? Asking questions is the key in the psychology because the laser can deliver on so many things that changes that patient experience. And then when you recap all the benefits when you're done, they are truly blown away. And that leads into the next thing, which you talked about earlier was the clinical side of the equation. And I feel that if you can change that patient experience and take that anxiety away, then it opens up the door to get them to enroll in the care that they deserve and proactively treat these things. And that's more of the funner things for the dentist. And that comes second that I notice. And so that's the next thing I want you to expand upon a little bit. Once you've got that patient experience changed, people want things done. What are the main things that a laser brought you in regards to maybe talk some specifics, maybe about the top three or five things that you didn't think you could do surgically that you were now doing, and maybe even a same day dentistry. So maybe share with these guys what you found on your clinical growth surgically that the labor laser was able to deliver for you. Absolutely. So there's three main aspects of soft and hard tissue surgery with this laser and laser technology that I has had so much of an impact on my practice. And when I started looking at it, you know, the, the first one was the easy stuff, like the simple, like you're just getting into it. And for me, I, I'm a very big CAD CAM individual and I love digital technology and, and in-office milling and intro all scanning. And what I found was that the simple concept of gingival troughing and the impact that that had on my workflow. And I know that sounds really simple and not like a big deal, but when we're talking about marginal integrity and intraoral scanning and ease of scanning and having our auxiliary team members have a simple, easy process, a frictionless workflow, I, I didn't realize the impact that intra, like troughing with a laser would have around my crowns. I mean, that was a big bulk of my restorative workflow was crowns. And yeah. well, th there's a reason, Tim, that uh, they used to give away a diode with a CERAC at the beginning, right? right? <laughs> the difference exactly though, that, like, so they didn't underestimate that no and, and it's crazy because you know for for anybody so if, if you've used lasers you might understand this but if you've never used a laser if you've never used a diode or if you've only used a diode when you use a, a laser that the chromophore is water and collagen and soft tissue it literally is like photoshopping and sculpting tissue it is, it is something that is to this day so rewarding. And every time I see it, it just blows me away. And so it just all of a sudden improved the quality of my care and it improved the easeability of scanning and for my assistance to mark margins. Like, and, and that was one aspect, like that was the, the starting point of like, hey, we're just gonna dabble in some of the soft tissue. What really kind of opened my eyes to what this type of technology could do for my practice was in relationship to phrenectomies. And 
most clinicians do not do any phrenectomies or they may only do one very rarely here and there. And what I, the reason this is important and impactful for me is because when I started having the ability to do something more easily and reducing that barrier, it opened my eyes to how many of my own patients that were in my practice for years that I was not doing the due diligence of truly being comprehensive in my diagnostic capabilities. And so when I started looking at how many of my patients had localized recession in the mandibular anteriors due to a high frenum pull, it was mind boggling because we're going to watch it. We're going to, what do we like? It was just one of those things because the barriers to have therapy as a clinician, I know they need a phrenectomy and they probably need a connected tissue graft. However, the barriers to get that patient to go to my periodontist, to have a scalpel and Z plasty done, to have all of this done was too much of a big deal for an issue for them that wasn't painful. It didn't bother them, but I knew would be an issue down the road. What, what I found was now I have a, a tool to allow me to do a procedure so easily at their hygiene visit that they don't have to take another appointment. They don't have to take more PTO. They don't have to do this, but then I could take photography or videography and pull their lip out and show them like, do you see this recession? Yes. And then I pull out the lip. Do you see this tissue that pulls on this? Yes. That is why that is occurring. Does that make sense to you? And it's like, everybody's like, well, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want that. And they're like, nobody's ever talked to me about this. And I'm like, Mrs. Jones, I didn't talk to you about that. And there's a part of us as a clinician, you guys, we have to own up to the fact that we are continually growing. It's the practice of dentistry. We're always learning. And what I would tell my patients, like Ms. Jones, I have learned more over the last couple of years continually. And this is one of the things that we are investing in this type of technology to better serve you. And it's to allow us to do procedures so that you can get the care that you need in our office. And all of a sudden, like we were doing phrenectomies, like multiple phrenectomies a month. And that's just part of what we do. And my, and you talk about team integration early on, it was me looking at it going, Oh, we can do this. Now my, I walk into the job and my hygienists are like, Tim, there's a high frenum pull. We talked about it. They need a phrenectomy. They're on board. Can we do this today? Or do you want to move this over to your chair later? And yep. that, has allowed more of our patients to get the care they need than anything was the fact that my hygienists saw the results, they saw the outcomes, and they saw how easy it was for the patients. They're the ones that believe in it. They're the ones that sell the dentistry. Yep. And Tim, I just want to interject, and I'm, I'm going to let you talk about your third point here in a second, but I, I wanted to just really magnify a couple of points that you made. Um, first, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a training doctor's like, yeah, I don't see freedoms. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm like, what, there's no phrenectomies in Michigan or San Francisco, what's going on here? And what's going on is you're not comfortable diagnosing what you're not comfortable doing. Bernie Stoltz has said this set time and time again, you're not going to do it if you're not comfortable doing it. And if you have a tool that makes it easy, you can just do a topical, you don't have blood all over, you can be proactive. Don't be a watch Adonis, guys. Things in dentistry don't get easier. They get more expensive and painful. And when a patient had that initial experience from restorative, you can make a comment. Like you said, your, your, your hygiene is already co-discovering. You're walking in and you're what I call a bobblehead dentist. You come in and you're going, yep, yep, yep. Because your hygienist has already told the story. They've already had that experience. And the biggest enrollment tool in dentistry is the intraoral camera, <laughs> guys. So I just wanted to expand on what Tim's doing and how some of these things are important. If you don't have intraoral pictures so that the patient can see it while you're educating them what you can do, you're missing the boat. The words, the dental words go over their head. But when you show a big picture on your 42 inch TV and you show them how that freedom's causing recession and it's only going to get worse, but Hey, it's no big deal. Now we can do a topical, you know, if you want to take care of that, so we're going to have a problem in the future, boom, they're enrolling. 
And what we just talked about and what I summarized takes some education. But I want to, I'm sorry to interrupt him, but I wanted to expand upon the audience how important some of those bullets that you just went over are to get patients to enroll in care. So I'll turn it back to you to talk about your third point. Well, no, and that's, and I, but I do agree that it is so important that what, what they're really doing is the pay, you're creating that value for the patient. Like the pay, when the patient buys into it, you're not having to convince them. They're, they just are like, when do I sign up? And the key to that is not me as the dentist. The key to that is educating my team and teaching my team. We do monthly meetings, sidebar, it always floors me how many offices don't do morning huddles, let alone a monthly meeting. But our monthly meeting, we always go over cases. We celebrate cases. And the reason for that is because A, my assistants are the only ones who get to see how good or how bad I am. They're the only ones, unless I show them. And so my hygienists, my front desk team, all of my front and back team, like we come together and we celebrate our clinical successes because I need them to see this is why we do this. So that way when my front desk is, you know, has a phrenectomy that's coming up, they can go, Mrs. Jones, this is the best decision you're making because you're going to save your teeth for the rest of your life. You were too young to have this issue. You're going to be, you're never going to regret this. And it's going to be so easy. You can go back to work that day. It's going to be easy. And so it allows them to understand because it's all about, and you know, my hygiene team builds it and they, they kind of build the foundation. I verify and affirm their knowledge base. It makes us look like a cohesive team. And then when we do our handoff to our front end team and the same thing happens where the front end team knows, hey, Ms. Jones, this is gonna be great. The phrenectomy is gonna help you. It looks like, wow, they're really tailoring this experience to me. It's about me. And that's what's important. It's not about your insurance, not about what you can pay, what, what the cost, it's about look at the benefits of what the treatment can do. So I think that's why phrenectomy has been huge because it's just opened the door for educating my team and allowing my team to see, wow, this is what we can do for patients. For me as a clinician, the third point that for me is the biggest wow is clinical crown lengthening. And this was the next evolution from going from soft tissue surgery that I was maybe being a little bit naive in what I was not seeing to my crowns where it was like, okay, you know, and, and what I mean by this is if you really look at the average dental practice and you look at the average number of crowns per month that a dental office is doing, the next follow-up question that I often have with CEREC doctors and clinicians is how much crown lengthening are you doing? Because if you're not doing a ton of implants, and you're not doing any crown lengthening, there, there's a problem there because you can't tell me that all of those crowns did not violate biologic width. And there's a lot of this situation, like we're just gonna bury it and we're gonna hope it works. And what it allowed me to do is crown lengthening, the, the whole system of crown lengthening was such a barrier because it involved me sending to a periodontist or a neurosurgeon or doing it myself, doing the, you know, we do the preps, provisionalize, do this, you know, surgery, keep them in that forever. It's like a six to eight weeks. It just goes on and on. And, and basically from the patient experience, it's like, they're going around this huge circle of like, okay, I got to go to this doctor, then this doctor, then temporaries, then a heal, then an oppression, then two weeks for the, the final crowns. And it's, it's ridiculous but we have the technology to allow us to provide not only a better patient experience, but better clinical outcomes. And that is where I really love it because I love how technology impacts my patients. I love it how it impacts my workflows. And what makes me the happiest is when I have all my technologies working together. When I've got cone beam and I've got intraoral scanning and I've got lasers and they all and 3D printing and they all come together for this happy little love baby of crown lengthening. It's amazing because I know I'm delivering care at a level that I never could before. And so we do clinical crown lengthening all the time because it's so easy. And it comes down to a fundamental difference of like how we've been delivering care. Like a burr 
is bloody. It's a messy field. You can't see what you're doing. It's all tactile. A laser is visual. It's audible. It's a visual field that's cleaned by water so you can actually see what you're removing and it. You can be so precise. It allowed me to do things that I couldn't do with just a bird. And it allowed me to do it in a fashion that didn't require 15 appointments. My issue now is if they are in an insurance network that I'm involved in, I, I, I literally have to tell the patient, I got to split this up into appointments instead of one, even though I can do it in one, because you either are going to have to pay for it all out of pocket or it's, it's just not going to work. So it's allowed us to start changing the way our patients perceive things, but it's, it becomes this evolution of simple troughing of tissue to, okay, now I'm going to remove a little bit more tissue and remove for phrenectomies. And if you want to get into tongue releases and all that stuff, and then evolve into crown lengthening. And what I think is more amazing is that they're like, I don't know, I forgot, Nick, you might know the total list of hard and soft tissue procedures with an all tissue laser. It's crazy. But for me, I'm an, I'm a general clinician that and is tailoring my practice to what my patients need and what I love. And it allows me to focus and funnel in on those things and maximize those things. Yep. And just to expand for those of you on the call that are not, do not have a laser or maybe aren't doing crown lengthening, don't think of traditional full thickness flap, you know, this big flap. You just need to get access to see what you're doing. And the patients heal so well. I've worked at implant centers. I've done all these. I've seen these multiple times. The patient comes back the next day. They're on aspirin therapy. No big deal. Doesn't hurt. So it's not this big flap that you're looking at. You're just creating enough access to contour the bone so that you can get the optimal biological width for longevity. And if it's in the anterior for, you know, to get your perfect, uh, you know, Fibonacci ratios so that it's perfect and you can move that bone the way it needs to be going very simply and very quick. Nick, if I may, I'm gonna take a quick sidebar just to walk you guys really quickly of clinical crown lengthening. This is my process, it's insanely easy. You take the tooth, you prepare the crown prep all the way, whether you violate biologic width or not. I get my laser out and I trough the tissue, even it goes all the way down to bone. The amazing part about this type of technology is that when you remove tissue in an atraumatic fashion, hemostasis is very easily managed. So it allows me to prep down to literally bone level and get a bone level impression digitally. And then I have my Intraoral scan, and I have the girls. Des I have the girls design and mill my crown. And usually, if it's bone level, then we're going to be doing a provisional crown. So I'll, they'll just mill it out of like a composite block or whatever. So they mill the crown. While it's milling, I literally tweeze the interproximal tissue away so that I can see the bone. I take the laser and I ensure, and I go back and forth with my peri probe and my laser. Sometimes even a bird just to help. And I go and I finish to get my adequate biologic width requirements. And then I suture it back together, take that temporary crown. We put the temporary crown back in. They come back in a week or two later. And literally the tissue is healed around my perfect crown. But the amazing part is my crown was scanned at the perfect margin. Like it was, it, it is the crown. So what the girls also do is they remill that temporary crown in zirconia or Emax. And all we do is literally take off the temporary, clean up the cement, take the permanent, put it on. That's it. Like it's that simple. It does not require this crazy flap, this craziness. It's literally do your crown prep like you always were. Use a laser to help isolate the field better than cord in that situation. You can't pack cord in that situation and allow the tissue to heal to the temporary crown you made. It's an amazing workflow. It's so much fun. It like literally is one of my favorite procedures. So it's just yeah, that, that's, eliminating that's, the barriers. Well, that's awesome. Well, there's good news and bad news. Um, it's already quarter tail and I haven't got past my first bullet of the things I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> so I'm going to shift gears because that was awesome. And the one, the, the one thing we'll probably only have time to talk about one more. We may have to have you back, Tim, to talk about some of the other things. Absolutely. But I wanted to share or have you share if you could briefly, 
what social media has meant to your practice because I can't tell you how many practices I go in and, you know, what do you do on Facebook or Instagram or whatever? And I know by following you and some of the things that you've done. And when I go to practices, I say, go to Tim Anderson's website in River City Dental and check out what they're doing and try to duplicate it because I, I think you found some of the secret sauce. So tell me a little bit about what you've done with social media, photography, and what it's meant for your practice. So I, I wish, I'm glad you didn't lead off with this topic because we'd be talking about it all night because social media, you know, depending on where you are in your career is going to have two different meanings to you. And here's the thing. Our patients are consumers. We need to understand and respect and value the, that concept. And we need to understand how our patients are getting information. Like, I don't know, I have kids, my kids are, you know, 10 and 11 and my kids don't watch TV. They don't, they barely watch Netflix or Hulu. My patients, my patient, my kids consume all their information via YouTube. So then my question is how many of you guys are on YouTube? And when I start looking at, okay, you know, well, that's not my patient demographic. Well, if you're patient, you need to start pulling your patients. Like as a startup, one of the things we started doing was how did you hear about us? Like, I can't emphasize this enough. You have to ask your patients questions. You have to pull them because it's the only way to get true reputable feedback on your marketing strategies. And what I found out in my community that Facebook in my community was a huge avenue of patient attraction. That's how they were hearing about us. And so we started leveraging that. And when I look at what social media is in a practice, social media is an avenue for you to connect with A, your actual patients of record and show them what's going on and all that. And B, your potential patients of record. Let me emphasize this again. When your patients come into your practice, they've already bought into everything about you. They are sold. When they make that appointment, they are sold. There's no more selling after that. But they, you need to make sure that how they came to you reflects who you are. And, you know, I see this all the time, like people, you know, it was getting like, they just throw the signs of like, you know, happy dentist, put a crown on me. Like, what I think is most important about social media is that it needs to be genuine. It needs to be a reflection of you as a person. It doesn't need to be crazy. Like it just needs to be you and your patients will understand that they'll be attracted to that. And from there it kind of rolls, but you got to ad advocate to your patients. You know, you, you start looking at like, how many of you guys know who the dentist is? And if you don't know who the dentist is, he is the number one social media person that is a, a clinician as a dentist. He's an orthodontist. His story is insane. And the reason his story is important is because he was at a practice and he saw his, these patients on this app and he was like, what the hell is that? Like, what are you guys doing? And they were on TikTok before a lot of people are on TikTok. And he's like, what is this? And the, the kids would show them like, ah, oh, this, this video. So he got on TikTok and he was the first adult on TikTok and he blew up and then he went to YouTube and blew up there. But what his story really emphasized was he asked the right questions. He saw his patients interacting in a way that he didn't know. And it's not about what he knew or what he wants. It's what do your patients want? And it emphasizes the follow-up question of who are your patients? And if your answer to that is any warm body that'll come into my chair and pay my fees, that's a recipe for disaster. You need to have very targeted strategy to find out who your people are. And the easiest way is look in your own practice. Who do you like in your practice? Who are the people that bring you the most joy, bring you the most procedures that you like, and you focus on them. If it's 60 plus, focus on that. What are, how are those individuals getting their social media? The generalized older demographics are probably going to be on, you know, Facebook. That's probably going to be one of the bigger avenues for them. You know, if you're looking at a younger demographic, then you're looking a little bit more on Instagram, on, you know, Snapchat. There's a lot of things that are coming, you know, TikTok, it's been around for a while. Like, 
But the key is you have to stay relevant and you have to be, have this part of a, an aspect of like, you have to put out content. And the biggest thing in my practice, what has helped grow us is you need to provide value. You need to educate people and provide value. So what that means is not, don't give away free cleaning. It's not a giveaway or give me likes for this. It's provide a certain, like educate them. Like, did you know this is what we do? Did you know this is what, you know, this many people are missing a tooth and that may surprise people. But did you know that in our office, we can place an implant right here and you don't gotta be sedated. You don't gotta do this. And we can do it guided digitally and we can use a laser to uncover it. So we don't have to get, you know, like, if you educate your patients, you're creating value and all of a sudden you create a culture around that. And that's what social media has done for me and my practice is it's allowed us to better attract the people we like. I, I don't want the PPO. Like if you found me from your insurance like list, that's not the person that I want. If you found me because you found me on Instagram and you liked the type of dentistry and the services I provided, that's a different patient. People, patients, our team members do not know what we can do unless we show them. And that is so important to show it and be genuine. And I get it, not everybody's the funny guy. You don't need to be the funny guy. Your patients aren't coming into you because you're the funny guy if you're not the funny guy. Be you, be who you are. If you're really good at this, show them. If you're really passionate about 3D printing, do this. If you really like laser dentistry, do that. If you just like, you know, joking around and the interaction you have with your team, show that, but don't copy because somebody else is doing it. That, right. That's not and, what you want to do. Yeah. And one of the things your day goes by a lot quicker. If you, if you have a day full of friends as a full of day full of patients and you do that by being your authentic self, the bit of advice that I can give is don't use some stock footage or stock things. It's got to be your true self, your true teams, their birthday, the things that you're doing. They want to feel comfortable going in, knowing you. And like I said, you don't have to be a certain type of get person. Get involved, they, you guys. Like that's what, right. like one of the things we did is like get your, you don't have to do this as the doctor. Get your team involved. Recently, we just said, we have a, a, a front administrative team member who startles very easily. So I was like, you guys, let's try to scare her. And, and we're just going to record this randomly. And then we're going to stitch all these videos together because it's going to be funny. My team had so much fun scaring the crap out of this one individual. And the individual had fun doing it. And it just became this great team bonding thing. But I always tell my team members like, hey, part of you being at this practice is you're vested into the success of this business. And as we grow, you grow. So part of that is, hey, if you notice, I want you on social media. I want you on Instagram. Let me know if you see something like, man, there is this trend going on that's super popular. Let's let's maximize that. Or like, hey, I keep seeing our patients are, are involved in these activities or our community is doing this or that. How do we get involved with that? But get your team involved. It gives them ownership and it allows them to buy into the process and it helps create that culture of people around the practice. But right. you have to get everybody involved and it takes that hat off of the doctor so you don't feel like you have to do everything. Like you'll go crazy doing everything. Right. And think about, you know, if 85% if of the people are nervous coming to the dentist and they see what you're doing and it's fun, it'll change that paradigm and that's what they want. And then also education is important and we're short on time, but I want to end with one more thing on the social media because you got to show your true authentic self, you know, sh show, have fun, be yourself educate on the technology. Like I said, don't let it be your market work. Wow, you can do that in dentistry. It's your job to educate them as clinicians and into practice. So educate them. And the third thing that I think is important is knowing, show some before afters or what you can do. What are some of the biz biz biggest things you got feedback on? And I'm going to end with this after you answer it in regards to some of the clinical before after or patient photos. What are some of the things that have the biggest impact? Biggest impact on from before and afters? No, from, from patients going, wow, that's something oh. I want to do, or I'm going to come um, to Dr. Anderson because of this, or the most likes you've got, or the most feedback, or maybe the most referrals, or whatever it may be. 
Yeah, so um, I would say by far our most impactful thing that I've seen two things on social media with us is I did a, you know, it, your patients are your best advocates, use them. You know, if you've got a good patient who's articulate, they, they're normal looking, they're friendly, they love your practice. We all have those people that love us and we don't even know why but use them. And I did, I, one of the things is, you know, you, you said be genuine, do all this, but the other thing I will advocate for is high quality. You know, if you're gonna do something as a marketing campaign or something like that, don't use the cheapest videographer or something like that you can find, like have it be a reflection of you. If your practice represents high clinical outcomes, quality dentistry, your imagery and your videography need to match it. And so one of the things we did is I hired a local videography group that I really like their quality of work. And, you know, I interviewed them. I want to see, show me what you do. I want to know what you do. I don't care what you cost. Like, I just want to know what you do. And I like their work. And then I had them come do a piece specifically relating to laser dentistry and the impact that it had on the patient experience. And I had two of my patients come in. And I had them do an interview style with them where I was not involved. I allowed them to do it because for me, that was a little bit more authentic of like, I always think it does X, Y, and Z, but it allowed this camera crew to interview the patient and they got more out of that than I ever thought. And when we started pushing that, it brought so many more patients to our practice. But what I was surprised by is they weren't patients that necessarily needed the dentistry. They just were like-minded people. They connected with my patients. They're like, hey, this is a normal person and they like what they're doing there. They, they really feel passionate and, and that was something they connected with. And so sometimes it's not even about what they need. I mean, a lot of the patients that come to me for the laser never need the laser, it's ironic. But at the flip side, showing what you do has been another impactful thing because uh, there's a lot of people that are like, Hey, my dentist does X, Y, and Z, but you know, you can do it in a different fashion, a lot less bleeding, heals faster. And I've seen your, your clinical outcomes. And I'm like, I want that. And that starts to track. That's I think a transition in, in a clinician, when you start attracting people based on the service you provide, you've now entered into a level that you're not just a dentist because people buy into the, what you are providing. Your value is more than your degree. Your value is what you as an artist can provide. And that has been, been crazy impactful. The other thing that I did was, you know, when we start doing stuff, patients like to celebrate the successes of the practice. And so when we did a video of when we were moving from our little tiny startup to our, our big new facility. I literally did like an interview, just celebrating, like thanking the patients. Like we have had, we love this community. The community has been so good as you as patients have helped us grow. We can't meet the demand and the need for you guys. So we are doing this for you as a patient and always emphasizing that what we do is always targeted with the, the mission, the value and the vision of the patient and everything around that then becomes really pride for them. They are very proud. And one of the things that I really think is important is that people like nice things. People want, if they're going to pay money, it doesn't matter what your crown fee is. It's too expensive. It doesn't matter what it is. What patients like those, they want to come into a facility and they want to be a part of a community and a, a group of people that value and operate at a high level. That's why people like nice things like Apple, Tesla, why they like nice restaurants. It's the experience and they feel a part of that community. So that has always been really important in our marketing and our strategy with social media is to target that. And, and guys, I just want to end with this. When you find that person, and you guys know as clinicians and just being a human being with your sensory acuity, when you have that person that likes you guys, ask them to be a referral and they will. You just got to ask. So I'm going to end it with that, but I do want to, uh, Kevin's been behind the scenes and tracking any questions. So um, Kevin, if you could just let us know anybody having questions and I, I'd like to apologize because I wanted to allocate 15 minutes, but we started going back and forth. So I, I hope it was good, but Kevin, were there any, uh, no general questions. questions out there? No questions. And we are right at time. So good job, gentlemen. We'll wrap it up. All awesome. right.
appreciate well, it. Well, thank you, Dr. Anderson. We greatly appreciate it. If there's anything else that you guys wanted out of this or want more information on, feel free to contact me. It's on, uh, you can contact us. It's on the, the sheet where you did the registration and I appreciate all your guys time. And again, thank you, Dr. Anderson, for all your valuable advice. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys.